So let's get one thing straight. God of War is an amazing game. There is no equivocation. There is no denying it. It is amazing. And in this spoiler-free mic checks out, I'm going to talk to you about why I think it is the case. Now, I have completed the game. Usually when I do these videos, I haven't completed the game, but I have actually fully completed God of War's story and are now into the end game, kind of after game content, battling the bad bosses that you have to pick up, which is great fun. Um, but first and foremost, God of War is an amazingly gorgeous looking game. I mean, just look at it. It is, the environments are incredible. The character models are incredible. Um, the game just looks great. It is up there, if not better than the best of them. It looks as good as any of, you know, it looks as good as the Untarted, it looks as good as the Horizon Zero Dawns, you know, Hellblade, which is a fabulously good looking game that took place in a very similar world to this, certainly mythology anyway, all look gorgeous. This one is one of the most gorgeous, if not the most gorgeous games available on the system at the moment. Um, the character design, the detail in those designs, the in design in the environments, all of this stuff brings together a very cohesive world that we're exploring with Kratos and Atreus. It is lovely. So as far as graphics are concerned, Santa Monica Studios have done an amazing job of creating a world and an environment that is a joy to discover, a joy to explore, and brings surprises and tricks and breathtaking moments on a, on a regular basis just because of how wonderful it looks and how brilliantly it plays. So from a graphical perspective, this is incredible. It runs incredibly smoothly. I didn't experience any kind of lag or anything unpleasant like that when I was playing the game. It was just, it was just consistently gorgeous. So it looks gorgeous, but how does it play? Well, the fact is it plays exceptionally well. Uh, there is a real scent or sense of presence and weight with Kratos as you are controlling him. Um, his interaction with the environment has heft. I mean, we're looking at a battle sequence here and it is crunching. But, I mean, we'll talk about combat in a minute, but the, the way that the characters are modelled, the way they're animated, means that they feel very, very connected to the environment. So, from a gameplay perspective, combat, which I'll talk about later, is very good. Traversal is good. Exploration is good. The, the second to second feel of the game has direction, immediacy, it has a sense of flow, um, which, which never seems to stop. So it's consistent in its gameplay. Now combat, and we'll talk about combat, is just fun. I mean, you've got this Leviathan axe. You can see us throwing around here at the moment. And I do cheese this a little bit by just throwing my axe at these. This is very early in the game. Uh, I'm not showing anything in this game that is beyond about two hours. Uh, which amazingly was exactly what Santa Monica Studio did with pretty much all of the trailers. Once I played the game, I was two hours into the game and I'd seen pretty much everything I'd seen in the trailers. They were very clever at not showing it further into the game to, to, to spoil it for us. So if you're approaching this, even having seen a few trailers, you are going to be surprised at every turn, certainly after the first couple of hours of gameplay. But there is a sense of weight to the combat. Um, when you are being hit by uh, characters, when you are striking characters, you know, that snap into the palm of the Leviathan axe as you're throwing it is satisfying as heck. You know, there is, he's not a, he's fairly nimble, but he's not a, a speedy character. So you have to plan and strategize a lot of the moves. As you begin to upgrade your abilities, as you unlock more moves, you'll create your own move set. There are so many different moves you can do. There's things that favor um, ranged combat with throwing the axe, defensive combat, as well as just getting in people's face and smacking with your axe. You'll begin to get your own rhythm and your own sense of the kinds of skills that work for you. So I think combat is going to be a very different experience for everyone because we're going to be looking at, uh, you know, putting together different combinations of moves. Um, and you have to be strategic and tactical with it. This is not an easy game. These enemies are your grunts. This is a couple of very, a few of the very first fights you get involved in. Um, as you go through, they get more intelligent, they get uh, stronger, uh, they will flank you, they will dodge you. Uh, and also a lot of your special moves can be interrupted, so you have to be very careful how you use them. So combat is absolutely visceral. It is it feels like you're in there at the moment. This close proximity to Kratos brings you into the center of the action. 
and at all times you are feeling in peril, even later on when you're feeling like a total god because you have so many fabulous abilities, um, you do feel vulnerable. One mistake with any one of these um, enemies can cause problems. There are enemies, even when you're very high level, that if you're not careful can one-shot you. So the combat is fluid, it is, it, un un it unwraps at a, a pace that it is easy to learn, but also means that as you go through the game, you feel more and more capable, you feel more and more powerful as you unlock moveset after moveset, as you start getting the runic attacks, which are the magical attacks, which just look brilliant, you begin to feel like a god of war. Now the elephant in the room with God of War is Atreus, the young man that accompanies Kratos, his son that accompanies throughout the whole of his journey. Uh, and we're always worried about having an AI controlled um, character because sometimes they're very poorly implemented. Well, if you think Ellie and you think Elizabeth in Last of Us and in Bioshock Infinite, two absolute joyful AI companions to have, Atreus beats them because whereas they did little bits of support in combat, you know, Elizabeth threw you ammunition every so often, Ellie would take a pot shot at uh, an enemy, Atreus becomes an intrinsic and vital part of the combat. Now, his artificial intelligence is such that when you're not controlling him, he is intelligently tripping up, um, uh, stunning, um, attacking enemies. But you control him very simply by hitting the square button. The square button will make him focus his attacks on a particular enemy. And that focus means you can build up stun, you can take out weak enemies or airborne enemies. And actually he becomes quite tactical in the way he, you, you use him. He gets special abilities himself as you level him up and it means that he is a strategic part of your combat. So absolutely vital and beautifully implemented. And we'll talk about him as a character anyway. In terms of combat, he becomes your good right arm. He becomes a person who can interrupt, can stun. You can only do the fabulous finishing moves where you're ripping beasts apart with your bare hands if they have a, a high level of stun. And Atreus is a great way of getting their stun up so that you can finish them off and rip them apart. Very gratifying finishing moves if you manage to do that. So combat is absolutely phenomenal. So gameplay elements, traversal and exploration of the world is brilliant. The combat is visceral and it is fun uh, and, and is, is imperiled. You don't feel safe, even in some later battles when you're feeling powerful, you don't feel entirely safe, which is great. I don't like necessarily feeling completely overpowered. You want to feel that combat has some risk in it. And even playing on normal, which I did, that combat is very, very, very satisfying and makes you feel that you are earning those victories through skill and through ability rather than just because you're massively overpowered. So combat's great. There are puzzle elements to the game. Um, puzzle elements in terms of there's some traversal puzzles, but mainly they are about accessing new areas or unlocking special chests. Most of the combat, sorry, most of the puzzles, sorry, is done um, through the Leviathan Axe by throwing the axe and also in some cases through um, Atreus and his bow. Generally they are to do um, to get upgrades and unlock areas to get chests which I'll talk about in a second. As you can see here I'm in the middle of a fight and I'm already in trouble. Um, but there is a puzzle element to it which um, doesn't feel shoehorned in. It feels fairly organic and fairly natural within the, yeah, the game itself. So it's like, oh, here's a puzzle. It's, you know, here's an area that has some puzzle elements to it. You know, they're optional. You can choose to um, do the puzzles or not. But some of the puzzles are intrinsic to part of the leveling up process. But they are environmental and they are head scratching. Sometimes it'll take you a while to figure them out, but you will figure them out. They never get to the point where you're getting frustrated with them. You will always eventually have, um, have the solution by trial and error or by suddenly going, oh, that's what I'm doing because you just happen to see something from a different angle or you know, you just see something fresh. So the puzzle elements are great and they are tied into part of progress, which I'll talk about next. Because one of the things that was um, criticized about the game by some people was the fact that the um, leveling up system was not particularly transparent. 
Um, I will agree to that to an extent, but I didn't struggle with it. What happens is there are lots of elements that upgrade and the upgrade slightly differently, and there is not an awful lot of assistance within the game for you to understand how they work. So, for example, um, Kratos is health. You can see in the bottom left-hand side of the screen there, and he's just gone into Spartan Rage mode. You've got the green bar, which is your health, and you've got the um, orange bar, which is your Spartan Rage, which I'm using to wreck some dudes right now. They are upgraded through finding chests in the environment. Uh, you find chests that contain apples for your health and um, kind of uh, horns that uh, upgrade your um, rage. Now you need three of those to have an upgrade. The upgrade is significant as well. You can upgrade a maximum of three times um, and you have to solve puzzles to open chests to find those apples or those horns which will add to your health. So you get them in sets of three. Once you have three, you upgrade. Significant upgrade, it, makes, it really does make a difference. It's not an incremental tiny thing, it's a big old upgrade. So that encourages you to explore the environment and solve these puzzles because they will have a benefit. So your health and your rage meter is upgraded through finding things in the environment. Now, you also have gear. So your Leviathan axe, um, Atreus's bow, and your armor is upgraded through finding materials in the environment and through hack silver, which is the currency that you discover as you open chests, as you do various things within the environment. And you upgrade them at the shops, which are run by two hilarious dwarves. Um, so by upgrading, by finding materials, you can upgrade your armor and create new armor to improve your statistics. And the statistics are things such as strength and vitality and luck and runic, which is your magic power cooldown, which means you can use your, your magic power more often. Um, and what you get is that each set of armor will favor various different ways of playing. So I went for strength and I went for defense because I wanted to kick stuff hard in the teeth. In my next playthrough, I'm going to go for runic and cooldown so I can use my magic abilities more, um, more frequently. But that gear is upgraded through things you find in the environment and through money. And then you have your skills. You saw the skill tree uh, about uh, 20 seconds ago. The skill tree will give you um, additional skills in terms of ranged attack like that, defensive attacks with your shield, or uh, Atreus's attacks with his bow, or your general attacks with, your, um, with melee. And they are upgraded very simply by earning experience, and you get experience by defeating enemies and completing quests. And the other thing that you can upgrade are your magic attacks. You can have two magic attacks which you slot into your axe, and uh, they can be upgraded using experience points as well, no materials required. So essentially, life and rage upgraded by, um, upgraded by finding things in the environment, armor and weapons upgraded by finding materials and spending money, and then your skills and your runic abilities are upgraded through your experience points. And I would highly recommend putting some experience points into Atreus' skills as soon as possible. They are brilliant. That is a special move that I've unlocked called the Executioner's, ooh, Executioner's Swipe or Slash or something like that. It's really good. Uh, you can upgrade that later on so it hits things twice. Then you cut them in half and chop their heads off and you kill them. It's really cool. Um, so it takes a little while to get your head round, but certainly within a few hours of playing the game, you should be upgrading um, no problem at all and understanding how that works. Good parry there. You can upgrade your parry, which can have counterattacks and all sorts of things into it. But the thing I want to talk about most is the story. The story in God of War is, is quite phenomenal and one of the best I've ever experienced. And the thing is that unusually is one of the simplest stories ever told, I think, in narrative games. We know through the trailers that Atreus and Kratos are father and son and that their mother stroke wife has died and we are taking her ashes to a specific place in, um, in Midgard where, uh, where this takes place in Norse mythology. Um, and that is the story and that's all the story is. That is it. It is Atreus and Kratos taking these ashes to a particular place. And that is consistent throughout the whole of the game. The driving force of the game is their journey to this point where they can scatter the ashes of, you know, of their loved one. 
And that is as simple, that's as, as complicated as it gets, it really is. Now you have an antagonist, you are being hunted through this for reasons that are not apparent until the end of the game. And I would encourage you, once you've got to the end of the game and you finish the story, to play through it because there's a conversation that happens right close to the beginning of the game that makes so much more sense when you know exactly what's going on and, and where the game has gone. Um, there is an antagonist and there are other uh, people that you meet during the game. Um, you know, there is a, we've seen a, a female um, in the uh, trailers which uh, you interact with quite a bit. There are the dwarves who sell you stuff. There are two slightly shoehorned in characters, I think, to create some boss battles and set some stuff up for the inevitable sequel. Um, there is the antagonist, and there is also another character that accompanies you through some of the game, who is both hilarious um, and also fills in a lot of lore and explains about the mythology of Odin and Thor, so you begin to get a context for what's going on in the world. And all of these characters work together to enhance this very, very basic story, to create, to drive this story forward and, and give so much more interest and colour around the world that you're in. And also, once you understand right at the end of the game what's been going on, a lot of what's been talking about becomes highly relevant. So you kind of begin to backfill some of the things you've heard earlier. So despite the simplicity of the story and the fact that there is a very small but brilliantly drawn group of characters, the voice acting is superb, um, the facial animations are absolutely on point. The thing that really, really, really draws you into the game are two decisions made by Corey Barlog, who is the creative director of this game. First is that the camera never cuts away from the action. There is a single camera shot that carries you through the whole of the game. So even in cut scenes, there isn't a cut to look at someone else. The camera will move to look at that person or move to look at that vista and eventually circle back to be behind Kratos. There is a seamlessness between gameplay and cutscene that means that, that there is no change. There is no, sometimes you're, you're standing there and suddenly you realise you're no longer in control because the cutscene is that seamless. And this camera has this consistent movement, so it's a single cut. The only time the camera cuts is when you fast travel or when you die. But for the rest of the narrative, the camera is always there in the centre of the action, drawing you into the action, making you more of a, a part of the action rather than an observer, someone a passive, passively looking at it. And it is a genius piece of design, which Car Corey Barlock apparently wanted to bring into the, the Tomb Raider game. He was part of the Tomb Raider reboot, the uh, Tomb Raider reboot, which is a, a, a great game, really enjoyed it. But he got his way with God of War, and by goodness it works. I mean, you don't really feel how well it works until you're in there until it's something that you've experienced. It is, it adds so much um, honesty and, um, and intensity to the action that is driving the piece. And then the critical element of this is the relationship between Kratos and Atreus. Atreus is a joy to have around. He is not, well, he's a brat when he needs to be a brat for, for story purposes. You know, he's an adolescent. He's going to be a bit bratty. I have a house full of adolescents. Um, and they're wonderful normally, but every so often there are pains in the bum. And Atreus is no different. He's someone who is desperately seeking approval from a father he doesn't know very well. Atreus was very much raised by his mum, and although Kratos was around, he didn't engage himself. And there are story reasons why he didn't engage himself, which you know come out and add real colour and depth to Kratos' character. He's a beautifully drawn three-dimensional character, despite his very grumpy, stoic nature. And you have this bubbly, effervescent, energetic young man that's a beautiful counterpoint to that. And the thrust of it is their relationship. It's how they come together, how they actually establish through ups and downs and through this journey they're taking together to you know, scatter the, their loved one's ashes, how they begin to understand each other and build a relationship which is constructive and healthy, that is mutually respectful. Um, and it is so incredibly well done. The subtleties of the animation and the, the clarity and the intelligence of the, the voice acting means that this is one of the most believable relationships that you'll get, despite the unbelievable nature and the fantastic nature of the environment. Now you're fighting dead things and you are you know, talking to giant serpents and you are battling gods. Now, despite the fact that it's in this incredibly fantastical environment, you have this 
core honesty and realism that is transmitted through the relationship of these two characters and also the relationship to some of these side characters as well which means that this game is affecting on, on an emotional level that you connect with these characters in a way that is unusual in games. Now the closest thing you have to it, and it's not an unfair comparison, it's unfair to compare God of War to Last of Us in terms of game because they're very very different animals. They're third person games that have a, a parental and child relationship. But the way that Joel and Ellie's relationship uh, developed throughout The Last of Us was so subtle and beautiful and it was the way body language changed and the way they spoke, spoke to each other changed that is very much front and center here with god of war the relationship with atreus and kratos is so beautifully put together and so utterly believable that it means that the game has real heart and real center and you can then you can then really just relax and engage and understand and believe the story despite the unbe unbelievable nature of the environment you can believe in the story and these characters it has a very very good payoff at the end um, with some realizations which i'm not going to spoil for anyone um, and then once the game is finished you can go and do all the the really difficult end bosses which i'm currently doing at the moment i'm wrapping up all the end stuff um, you've got uh, eight really tough bosses. I've managed to get four of them so far, but I need to level up a bit. There are some trials to do. There are side missions that you can engage with at any point during the game, um, which adds real value because they're interesting and fun. And you will be distracted by side quests and go off. And sometimes Atreus says, well, we can continue our journey if you like, but we could always go over there and have a look at that. And you'll go, do you know what, Atreus? I think I probably will. And it's just so beautifully coherent and consistent that you can't help but want to go and see what's over the next horizon to take on that side quest because it's adding so much more value to the game. I will, a couple of tiny criticisms before I wrap up. Firstly, the really visceral and brilliant um, kind of fatality animations, they, they're not, there's not enough variety. And if you're in a game that's 20 hours long, um, it does become a bit repetitive after a while, but that's a very, very minor criticism um, because it still looks absolutely epic and cool when you do it. Um, also, the story beats, the story is amazing, but it does have that trope that is very much, we go here, we found a barrier, we have to overcome that barrier to go there. So every time you step forward, you step back before you can step forward and step back and step forward and step back. Um, and although it doesn't impinge on the storytelling at all because it's so artfully done, every so often you'll go, oh, here we go again, I've got a barrier and I'm going to have to go over here and find a doodad. It doesn't matter because finding the doodad is joyous. But it does remind you sometimes that you're playing a game, whereas up to that point you have very much been involved in an experience. You're kind of very much invested in what's going on. Uh, it's not a big criticism, and I can't criticise a game very much because there's very little it does wrong. But it would be nice to have been had a greater variety of the uh, fatality animations. Uh, and it, I don't know how they could have improved this bit, but sometimes it feels a little um, gamey in as much as there's a barrier, we have to find a doodad to get past the barrier, and that happens a number of times in the game. Um, but not to the point where it loses any of its impact or impetus. It just it just means that you know you're in a game. Here we go. I've just solved a puzzle, and I'm going to get. I think this is is this an apple? I think this is an apple, and this is one of the things that will um, uh, will increase my health. And you saw the puzzle solving elements of that. You can you can roll back and have a look at what we did. I had to break some pots with runes on it. That's a very basic one. They become a lot more complicated later on. So, in conclusion, God of War bloody brilliant uh, if you have a ps4 if you like games that are intelligent um violent visceral with fabulous gorgeous looking worlds with intelligent witty funny heartbreaking dialogue and characters that you can invest in and believe in i would highly recommend picking this game up it will tick all of your boxes and you will not regret the time you spent on it by god of war it is actually it does live up to the hype in pretty much every single way. So get it, play it, love it. Thanks for watching. Like it if you've liked it. Share it if you think someone else would like it. And click on the button that's on the screen right now to subscribe if you want to see more of my stuff. Thanks very much. Have a fabulous gaming week and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye for now.